Minnie McCulloch was born in Greenock, nestled in the heart of western central Scotland. Her father, John McCulloch, made his mark as a railway engineer. Tragically, her mother, Elizabeth Swan, succumbed to cancer in 1857. Minnie's journey to New Zealand remained shrouded in mystery, yet by the early 1860s she had settled in Invercargill, accompanied by her two young children. Though she professed to be the widow of a Tasmanian doctor, there exists no corroborating evidence of such a union. Throughout this period, she continued to go by her maiden name, McCulloch. In 1872, she entered into marriage with Charles Dean, an innkeeper. Their house, nestled in Edel Creek, was situated between Ojai and Lumsden, a pivotal junction on the route from Riverton to Otago Goldfields. As the allure of gold waned, the Deans transitioned to agriculture, yet soon found themselves grappling with dire financial straits. Seeking solace in Winton, they pursued pig farming while Minnie, in her resourcefulness, ventured into the realm of baby farming, a practice wherein she cared for unwanted infants in exchange for payment. In an era marked by limited contraceptive options and societal stigma against unmarried childbirth, there existed a considerable demand for discreet adoption arrangements. Minnie Dean found herself inundated with clientele seeking such services. It is speculated that she concurrently cared for as many as nine young children, receiving compensation either in weekly installments or lump sums. During this era, infant mortality posed a significant challenge in New Zealand, with estimates suggesting mortality rates ranging from 80 to 100 infants per 1,000 colonial births. As a result, several children under Dean's guardianship succumbed to various illnesses. In March of 1889, a six-month-old infant passed away due to convulsions. In October of 1891, a six-week-old baby succumbed to cardiovascular and respiratory ailments. Further suspicion arose in 1894 when a boy reportedly drowned under Dean's care, and she allegedly concealed the body in her garden. While coroner's inquest convened, Dean was not held accountable for the deaths owing to the prevailing poor hygiene standards prevalent even during childbirth. Nonetheless, the community's trust in Dean dwindled, fueled by rumors of mistreatment. Moreover, children under her supervision reportedly vanished without explanation. These circumstances, coupled with perils drawn to the cases of infanticide or baby farming in the United Kingdoms and Australia, contributed to public skepticism toward Dean. At the time, lenient child care regulations exempt Dean from maintaining records of the children she took in, complicating efforts to ascertain the fate of the missing children. Before Dean faced trial and eventual execution, four other women had undergone similar legal proceedings. Caroline Whitting, convicted in 1872, and Phoebe Veach in 1883 were among them. In 1891, Sarah Jane and Anna Flanagan also faced the same fate. Despite receiving death sentences, all four women had their punishments commuted to life imprisonment. The charge in each case was child murder. Nearly three decades later, in 1926, Daniel Cooper met a similar fate for his involvement in baby farming, ultimately facing execution. Interestingly, his second wife, Martha, was acquitted of any wrongdoing. On a broader scale, Dean's actions could be perceived within the same framework as other late Victorian contemporaries, known as baby farmers, such as Amelia Dyer in the United Kingdom, who was convicted in 1896, and John and Sarah Mankin, convicted in 1893, along with Frances Lydia Alice Knorr in New South Wales, also convicted in 1893. Furthermore, historical instances of suspected deliberate child death in New Zealand were noted, drawing parallels to Dean's case. The Mankin case from New South Wales even gained traction in New Zealand newspapers during the same period as the Minnie Dean controversy and trial. In 1895, suspicious circumstances arose surrounding Dean's activities when she was observed boarding a train accompanied by a young baby in a hat box. However, upon her departure from the train, only the hat box remained without the presence of the infant. Railway porters later testified that the hat box seemed unusually heavy. Jane Hornsby stepped forward, asserting that she had entrusted her granddaughter, Eva, to Dean's care. 
Clothing belonging to Eva was discovered at Dean's residence, yet Dean could not produce the child herself. A thorough search along the railway line yielded no trace of the missing child. Dean was subsequently apprehended and charged with murder. During the investigation, her garden was excavated, revealing the remains of three individuals, two infants, and a boy estimated to be three years old. An inquest determined that one child, Eva, had died from suffocation, while another, identified as one-year-old Dorothy Edith Carter, had succumbed to an overdose of laudanum, administered to sedate her. The cause of death for the third child remains undetermined. Dean faced charges of murder in connection with these deaths. During her trial, Dean's attorney, Alfred Hanlon, contended that all the deaths had been accidental and that any attempts to conceal them were aimed at avoiding the negative publicity Dean had previously endured. On June 21, 1895, Dean was convicted of Dorothy Carter's murder and sentenced to death. Between June and August of the same year, Dean penned her own account of her life. According to her narrative, she claimed to have nurtured a total of 28 children. Among them, five were reportedly in good health when her establishment was raided, six had tragically passed away while under her care, and one had been reclaimed by their parents. Excluding her two adopted daughters, this left approximately 14 children unaccounted for, as per her own admission. On August 12th, she met her fate at the hands of the official executioner, Tom Long, who hanged her at the old Inver Cargill Jail. Her execution marked the sole instance of a woman being put to death in New Zealand's history. She now rests in peace in Winton, laid to rest beside her husband, who tragically perished in a house fire in 1908. Around 1864, William and Roxalana Drews married. Their union brought forth two children, Mary, their eldest daughter, aged 19 when William met his tragic end, and George, their youngest son, aged 10 at the time of the incident. Their homestead was situated in Warren, a quaint hamlet nestled in Herkimer County, New York. Alongside their children, they shared their home with William's 14-year-old nephew, Frank Gates. William, aged 56, met his demise during this period. The Drews family grappled with financial woes and garnered a negative reputation within their community largely attributed to William's violent temper, profanity-laden outbursts, and disregard for Sundays as a day of rest. Both neighbors and the Drews children were well aware of William's abusive behavior towards Roxalana. He was known to physically assault her, once striking her with a horsewhip and even paying off a neighbor to keep quiet about the incident. Mary, their daughter, vividly remembered instances where William used branches from their apple tree to strike Roxalana. Moreover, he resorted to choking her and threatening her with a pitchfork. Prior to her trial for William's murder, Roxalana candidly remarked that her husband had only displayed decency on their wedding day, advising against marriage and stressing the need for greater consideration before taking such a solemn vow. On December 18, 1884, William Drews vanished under mysterious circumstances. According to Roxalana's account, on the fateful morning of the murder, a heated argument erupted between her and William. In the midst of the altercation, Mary allegedly looped a rope around William's neck while he was seated at the breakfast table, while Roxalana proceeded to shoot him in the neck. She then purportedly coerced Frank into shooting William under the threat of his own demise. Subsequently, Roxalana reportedly decapitated her husband with an axe. She proceeded to dismember the remains and incinerate them in the stove. The ashes, along with the revolver and axe, were disposed of in a nearby pond. Neighbors grew increasingly suspicious as William remained absent for several weeks. Roxalana's explanation that he was visiting New York City failed to quell their concerns. As a result, law enforcement launched an official inquiry into his disappearance, prompting them to question Frank Gates on January 16, 1885. Gates ultimately confessed to his involvement in William's murder, implicating both Roxalana and Mary. As the investigation unfolded, authorities discovered human bone fragments among the ashes discarded near the pond, along with the blood-stained axe utilized in the crime, 
and a blood-stained floorboard within the kitchen of the Drews farmhouse. Mary Drews admitted guilt to the charges leveled against her and received a life sentence. She was transferred to a penitentiary located in Onondaga County, New York, to serve out her punishment. Roxolana's trial spanned a duration of two weeks in October of 1885. Throughout the trial and its aftermath, Roxolana's case gained significant attention within the budgeting first-wave feminist movement in the United States. Advocates for women's rights voiced their support in a petition, asserting the need for justice against abusive men and empathizing with the plight of their victims, who often lacked representation and understanding of the legal system. Roxolana faced an all-male jury who found her guilty of first-degree murder on October 6, 1885, and subsequently sentenced her to death. Initially slated for execution on November 25, 1885, the date was later postponed to February 28, 1887. Leading up to her scheduled execution, New York Governor David B. Hill received an array of letters from across the United States expressing strong sentiments regarding Drews's impending fate. Some urged him to commute her sentence, while others questioned the morality of hanging a woman. In response to this outcry, the New York State Legislature proposed a bill to exempt women from the death penalty. However, the bill was defeated in an assembly just 10 days prior to Drusa's scheduled hanging. Among the correspondence received, one particularly disturbing letter included an offer from a man willing to pay $10 for the opportunity to personally carry out Drusa's execution. Additionally, numerous citizens volunteered to finance the rope for Drusa's hanging, with some even suggesting that the rope be showcased on an exhibition tour throughout New York following the execution. Despite these pleas and offers, Governor Hill remained resolute in his decision not to intervene in Drusa's sentence. On February 28, 1887, Roxolana Drus met her end by hanging in Herkimer County. The gallows were hidden from public view with only 25 designated witnesses. Accounts from witnesses revealed that Drus remained silent upon the gallows, yet her distress was palpable through her moans, cries, and eventually piercing shrieks. These sounds reverberated so forcefully that they reached the confines of the jail and spilled into the nearby streets as her executioners veiled her face with a cap. At 11.48 a.m., the hanging commenced, and by 12.03 p.m., Roxolana Drews was declared deceased. The execution method employed was an upright jerker employing a 213-pound counterweight designed to lift the condemned individual into the air upon release. However, despite being raised four feet above the ground, the force failed to snap her neck. Instead, physicians concluded that she succumbed to strangulation. Alice Mitchell was born in 1872 to George and Isabella Mitchell. Unlike many girls her age, Alice showed little interest in traditional toys, preferring instead to spend her time on the swing in her yard or engage in games of baseball and football. She shared a close bond with her brother Frank, with whom she played marbles, and honed her marksmanship with a rifle. Alice also had a fondness for horses, often assisting in the care of her father's steed. Despite her mother's efforts to teach her sewing and needlework, Alice never took to these tasks. Moreover, she displayed little interest in boys, sometimes even exhibiting rudeness towards them as she grew older. Alice and Frida first crossed paths at Higby School for young ladies, where they formed a close bond that went beyond the norm for friendships at the time. Their affection for each other was evident through gestures like kissing, hugging, and holding hands. Behaviors not regarded as homosexual in that era, but rather termed as chumming in Memphis to describe intimate female friendships. Yet, their connection transcended mere camaraderie, with Alice harboring a deep obsession for Frida. Despite living in different cities after Frida's family relocated to Gold Dust, Tennessee, they managed occasional reunions, spending weeks together during these visits. Sharing a bed at night during their stays was customary. However, Frida's commitment to the relationship wasn't as steadfast as Alice's. She entertained the affections of two other men alongside Alice. Their relationship persisted until Frida's older sister and surrogate mother, Ada Volkmer, intervened, forbidding Frida from maintaining contact with Alice. 
Alice concocted a plan to assume a male persona, Alvin J. Ward, marry Frida, and relocate to St. Louis as a married couple, with Alice taking on the responsibility of supporting Frida financially. Surprisingly, Frida agreed to this unconventional proposal. However, their scheme was thwarted when Ada Volkmer stumbled upon the correspondence, including Alice's proposal, prompting her to send a stern letter to both Alice and Alice's mother, Isabella, warning Alice to stay away from Frida. With their relationship exposed and their meetings prohibited, Alice spiraled into a profound depression. She withdrew from her family, suffered from insomnia, and barely ate. Alice sought solace in memories of her time with Frida, often gazing at her photograph and rereading their letters. In a bizarre twist, she sometimes signed receipts with the name Frida Ward, claiming later that she was unaware of her actions. While in Memphis with her older sister, Joe Ward, and friend, Christina Purnell, Frida Ward encountered a harrowing event orchestrated by Alice. As Frida, Joe, and Christina made their way towards the river to board the steamboat Ora Lee bound for gold dust, Alice trailed them in a wagon driven by her companion, Lily Johnson. Spotting Frida on thawing ice, Alice approached her and, wielding a razor she had acquired for the purpose of cultivating a mustache for her planned elopement with Frida, viciously slashed her across the face. Despite Joe's attempts to intervene with an umbrella, Alice inflicted a severe wound on Joe's collarbone. Tragically, Frida succumbed to her injuries after Alice delivered a fatal slash to her throat. Distraught and contemplating suicide, Alice confided in Lily about her actions, who advised her to return home and confess to her mother. Both Alice and Lily were subsequently apprehended by authorities. While Lily was suspected to being privy to Alice's intentions beforehand, she was released on bond, whereas Alice was detained in jail pending further proceedings. During the summer, Alice did trial and was deemed presently insane, indicating her mental state prior to the murder. According to her own account, Alice confessed to killing Frida because she believed that if they couldn't marry, life held no purpose for either of them, and it was unjust for Frida to marry anyone else under those circumstances. All charges against Lily Johnson were dismissed, while Alice was committed to the Western State Hospital for the Insane in Bolivar, Tennessee. She passed away there in 1898. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to join our community. We upload every Monday and Thursday at 4pm. For more content like this, be sure to check out our other videos on the channel. You can also follow us on our other social media platforms for uploads and updates. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.